I cannot tell you enough how tired I got of hearing about cancel culture. The whole thing felt made up. It felt like a never-ending wave of past mistakes resurfacing. I watched plenty of apology videos, and then my grandpa mentioned it over dinner, and I was done. He went, and you know, with cancel culture these days, what does that mean? I took a semester ethics course recently, and one of the topics was cancel culture. Guess who had to be the discussion leader? And I realized in preparing for that discussion, I actually had no idea what cancel culture was. No one else did either, and most people still don't. And I also realized where the problem lies. Today, I'd like to talk about the ethics of cancel culture, and more specifically, the ethical principle accountability and how it's been misunderstood. In theory, ethics, being a virtuous person and adhering to moral principles is great, but in practice, not that simple. Ethics is very idealistic in its outcomes, very utopian. It can expect people to follow universal standards or simply strive to be better, which is always easier said than done. This is something I ask myself a lot in applied ethics. What does it matter if the ideal outcome will never be reached? Well, to paraphrase Aristotle, it matters because life is not meant to just be something, but to aspire towards something. I got tired of hearing about cancel culture because everything seemed to be about person after person who got canceled, what they did, their apology, if it was good enough, and the conversation on the implications of cancel culture. The bigger picture has been limited to reactions. In the number of articles I've read discussing cancel culture, a lot of them come up with their own definitions, from vague to the extreme. Here are some good ones. The lesson here is cancel culture is misunderstood and has thus lost its intention in the application, a little loss in translation moment for social media. After further research, I've come to define cancel culture as the mass withdrawal of support in an effort to deplatform. Deplatforming is removing or banning an individual or company from their mass reach communication medium. For example, social media platforms like Instagram or YouTube. And the effort to deplatform is an effort to remove the power of influence and communication. But other definitions look at cancel culture solely as canceling someone, not something, even though businesses have been canceled. There was a New York Times article in late 2019 that clearly displays this misunderstanding, titled Tales from the Teenage Cancel Culture. One of the teens in the article said she, can said she canceled a boy in her class for playing an R. Kelly song. She had just watched the documentary Surviving R. Kelly and said the boy wouldn't change the song, so she canceled him. But canceling is the withdrawal of support by a large number of people. This type of misunderstanding can be harmful to our relationships, especially when they're just being formed. It's important to have clear definitions and understanding, otherwise these words do more harm than good. This brings me to accountability. It has been perceived as the foundation of cancel culture. Some even consider cancel culture accountability culture. Throwing around words that are not interchangeable has led to a misconception of accountability. To understand this topic, we must begin with the individual. It begins with the ethical statement, what's right, demonstrates the type of person I am and who I want to become. Aristotle emphasized under this idea of what's right, that you're not automatically a virtuous person. Morals don't come by nature, but by habit. We learn by action, and each action doesn't define you, but your growth does. Life is about becoming and aspiring towards something. So. If you hold yourself accountable once and never again, it doesn't make you a virtuous person. Our habitual actions define us. Cancel culture has become a knee-jerk reaction that is harmful to growth. It doesn't promote learning and development. It can alienate people. And it's like that scene from Matilda. I'm smart, you're dumb, I'm big, you're little, I'm right, you're wrong, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now. There have been two main arguments for and against cancel culture. One calls it accountability, while the other calls it a threat to free speech. Both of these arguments are imperfect, but most importantly, neither address the depths of this issue. 
holding someone accountable and canceling someone are not interchangeable, but also not always mutually exclusive. And that is where the confusion stems from. There are those who have been canceled and also held accountable in a court of law. They have faced legal repercussions while others have not. In a Rolling Stone article published this year, February of 2023, Ernest Owens wrote, those who fear cancel culture may claim they fear suppression of speech, but it's accountability that they want to avoid. What Owens misses is that you cannot avoid accountability if there's nothing to be accountable for. In accountability, there must be clearly defined roles and expectations. They set the framework for what's right and wrong. A student isn't expected to grade the class's homework, so they wouldn't be held accountable for it. The teacher would be. The fear Owens mentions is quite misunderstood. This isn't wanting to avoid accountability. This isn't even the fear of saying the wrong thing. This is the fear of not being able to redeem oneself afterward. Which begs the question, who are the judge and the jury? Is it those around you who decide whether your apology is good enough, whether you've done enough to make amends? Yes. This is the fear of not being able to redeem oneself. There is anxiety when there are countless news articles about people losing jobs. Even if it's being dramatized, it's still being read. This movement exists on a very arbitrary level. It's a game of pick and choose when it comes to the public's next focus. Authors like Owens discuss accountability in the abstract and avoid its complexity. Dr. Melvin J. Dubnik actually defines accountability in four forms. There are two circumstances to fall under and 12 different variations of approaches. How's that for complexity? When we stop viewing concepts as only black and white, we can finally have a better chance of understanding them. Our role and identity in this situation affect how we will be held accountable. Think of your own roles a parent, a student, a teacher, an employee, an employer. Maybe you hold multiple roles. Each come with their own set of expectations that guide how you'll be held accountable for your actions. As individuals, we cannot be identified as right or wrong. That is the fatality of cancel culture. It diminishes a person to two possibilities, right or wrong. But people exist between the lines. Where our emotions may clash with our morals, our opinions may change over time or strengthen, we may grow up in one community with a set of values that we no longer align with as we age. Speaking of community, we're individuals, but we make communities. We have book clubs, support groups, neighborhoods, families. This is another way to look at what's right. It's the ethical statement, what's right is what serves the common good. It's important to note that the common good cannot exist if no one benefits from it. So, where is the common good in cancel culture? Where do we benefit from it? Well, there are more fear responses than we realize. One response is to simply pull back. Pull back from public discourse in an effort to avoid conflict of opposing opinions that might damage a relationship. In short, don't talk during Thanksgiving dinner about politics. This is further emphasized in former college student Emma Camp's opinion piece for the New York Times about self-censorship on campus. She wrote about those who self-censored in class to not get a lower grade. She said class discussions became monotonous echo chambers. These are symptoms of cancel culture. What do you do with symptoms? You don't take a cough drop and hope the sickness goes away. Symptoms are indications of a greater condition. And the greater condition here is a new perception of redemption, and it is cultural. When there is a fear of not being able to redeem oneself, we must adapt. And one way to adapt is to conform. Conform an ideology, essentially pulling back from conflict because there's a fear of not being able to come back from it, not be able to repair the damage caused. This pulling back creates the monotonous echo chambers where there is no discussion or conflict, there's only agreement, conformity. But we shouldn't accept that, we should challenge it. Change doesn't happen when people are comfortable and change can be an indication of growth. There is a common good in having a diversity of thought. We benefit from it. 
If there is anxiety present from expressing opposition, then we can no longer hold authentic conversations. A letter on justice and open debate, or the Harper's letter, was written in July of 2020 to address the self-censorship symptom. It was signed by 153 notable people in academia and the media, such as Margaret Atwood and J.K. Rowling. It discusses the new intolerance of opposing views, the increased risk aversion of writers and journalists in fear of losing their jobs, and the resulting ideological conformity. And it faced immediate criticism. The reactions talked mostly about those who signed it, including J.K. Rowling's involvement. I read the letter just last year, and I'd like to read the last two lines to you. We need to preserve the possibility of good faith disagreement without dire professional consequences. If we won't defend the very thing on which our work depends, then we shouldn't expect the public or the state to defend it for us. The Harper's letter received negative reactions because cancel culture is understood at such a surface level. Only looking at canceling people, influencers, or celebrities as though it's entertainment. But the implications of cancel culture is the bigger picture. This new perception of redemption as something unattainable can be damaging to a community. It affects the individuals within the community and how they interact with others. This isn't limited to life online, but our physical reality. We as people exist between the lines where we'll never be only right or wrong, and that fact needs to be embraced in its entirety. The human condition of emotion guarantees mistakes will be made out of pure emotional reactions. It's why when a villain's origin story gets a movie, you gain sympathy for them. They become more than villains. They become people with motives, desires, and dreams. I know I cried during Maleficent much more than I did in Sleeping Beauty. This moment goes beyond a cultural trend. Those who argue that cancel culture has been blown out of proportion are right in that it's not the epicenter of this conversation. Both accountability and alienation have consequences for the person in question, but accountability provides the opportunity to seek redemption. Alienation does not. Alienation in cancel culture does not equate to holding a person accountable for their actions. If this perception continues and alters how we hold people accountable, then accountability is no longer an ethical principle. It's a principle in the first place because it defends our moral judgments of what's right and wrong, and it doesn't depend on one's subjective viewpoint. Accountability doesn't rely on the court of public opinion like cancel culture does. The two must not be confused because the fear of not being able to redeem oneself can be overwhelming and prevent us from taking risks one of the most essential aspects of life. Cancel culture inherently dismisses growth. We differentiate the past, present, and future because there are multiple versions of ourselves. Who I was five years ago stayed there, and I don't know who I'll be in five years, but I know who I want to become. We meet people along the way, mentors, partners, friends. They hold the ability to change our opinions or simply broaden our understanding of the world. We are a compilation of experiences. That's what's between the lines of being a person. We're always striving to become people.